Speaking about moving forward, I want to read something to you before we jump into Exodus. I want to back up to uh, Genesis. If you're going to back up from Exodus, there's only one book to go to. It's Genesis. And uh, check this out with me. Genesis chapter 1. When God decided, I'm going to, I'm, well, he, knew, he knew ahead of time. He knew he was building a house for the man and for the woman. And so after the fifth day of creation, it says, uh, that, or on the sixth day, it says, then God said, now let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You got it there? Anybody got it? Verse 26. I want you to read this, this verse out loud with me. I'm going to pause at one point, and we're going to read the, the second half of it with focus and maybe some strength in your voice. Okay, let's read it together from the beginning of verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Pause right there. You ready for the next part? Read this with me. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the, in, in, we can go on. We're going to stop right there. The point is God created mankind, created the man and the woman to have dominion over this earth. They, they were the very first government Adam and Eve were supposed to govern the earth. They were supposed to have dominion. Something went wrong. Have you noticed? Something went wrong. They never took dominion over the earth. They, they, never, they, they didn't even get out of the garden before they blew it, and they were supposed to get out of the garden and travel. They never made it to California. They, they never made it to Switzerland. It would have looked different before the flood, but they never made it to those beautiful mountains and those beaches and and because of sin, I, I share this because it's going to come up again tonight in our study right at the end of our time in chapter 23 in Exodus. And I think, it's, I think it's a sobering thing to remember that God created us. We're going to, you see it in Revelation. We're created to rule and to reign with him under his authority. If I'm under the authority of God, I've taken the first step in my life to become a dominator, not in a bad sense, but to, be, to become one of his agents on this earth. And it's a sobering thing, and I'm not going to tell you that I understand all the implications of all that that means, but we will rule with him and reign with him. How many of you realize God doesn't really need our help to rule or reign anything? He, he keeps the universe in, you know, floating and expanding, and it's just frightening how immense it is, and it's so mind-boggling to think about going out to the end of everything that is and looking beyond and saying, well, what's out there? How many of you have ever tried to blow your mind that way just a little bit? And it just keeps going and going and going. Eternity, it's just an unbelievable thing because you don't know anything about what it's like to be in a timeless, measureless place that still has substance to it. And I better get into something else or I'll spend all my time on this tonight. But we'll come back to this thing about our boundaries and our borders. And I wonder if any of us have even begun to realize there are some great, great things that God wants to do through us. Uh, I mean, a great thing, not just safely get us to heaven by the skin of our teeth. He wants us to be people who, who beginning right now and right here, we understand what it is to be under his dominion and, and to move out in the power of his spirit. How many of you want the power of his spirit in just moving in you and through you for what reason? To reach people, to glorify him. Yes, to glorify him and reach people and do what he's about in this earth. He's loving people every single day and he chooses to love many of them through us. So I don't know how many you'll get to love, how many you've loved today for him, but uh, he's got more for you to love tomorrow for him including the ones that you already know. So, hey, I want to tell you that um, some of you had been asking, how did Joy's tests go? And we went to uh, the doctor today, and the doctor said there's no sign of any heart disease. Thank God. We're praising the Lord for that. And, and um, so, yeah, so we were really, really, really thankful to hear about that. And so thank you all for praying as well. All right, you ready? Are you really ready? Yep. Exodus 23. Exodus chapter 23. I might be doing just a tiny bit of backup tonight 
I'm not sure. This is Laws, Laws, and More Laws, Part 3. I'm not sure how many parts there's going to be in this Laws, Laws, and More Laws, but there's more laws to come after these tonight. So, Father, we're going to open up your word now to this wonderful book of Exodus. And, uh, gosh, Lord, the story of a, of, a, of a deliverance, the story of freedom, emancipation, Lord, of a nation, a whole nation, And Father, we see our story overlaid in here too. And so we thank you, Father, for this gift of freedom in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'd give us understanding in your word tonight, Father. Help me to make this clear. And so thank you, Father, for the scriptures that uh, will teach us tonight like they've taught billions of people before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Speaking of that in prayer, I was sitting over there thinking, it is amazes me that God would let someone like me take this holy book and open it up for somebody else and teach from it and, and hopefully kind of shed the light on the things that matter for us tonight. And I, I, I hope you see that they really, really do. Um, we're still at the mount that smoked with fire and the cloud and all that. And, and, and these are still, as it says on the screen, the words of God from Mount Sinai. And to begin with, in verses 1 through 9, as we're we're moving through this, God's still speaking. In those first verses, here's what he's going to say. Let justice roll down. He's going to be talking about how we do the just thing. How many of you know that that passage in uh, in Micah, chapter 6, verse 8? He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Who knows what they are? Do justly. Do the right thing, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And so we're going to dig into this tonight. Let justice roll down. These laws are going to sound like they were written for today, for such a time as this, and I think they were. Um, Solomon said that there was nothing new under the sun. We talked about that last week, and, and it is true. I, I, I don't know if you kind of wrap your, your own mind and heart around this, we sing it in one of the old hymns, but how many of you would agree, I'm prone to wander? Uh, and not just those like me that have ADHD or whatever I have, chronically distracted Bill, but how many of you are prone to wander, to get distracted from the truth and, and the way of God, and you wander into the weeds? And we all have. We all have done that. Um, but we're all prone to wander, and, so, and we look for ways to circumvent what God has said. I know it because I've done it, and I've talked to people that are in deep, deep weeds, and they've done it. I was, uh, I was walking this morning, and this morning's psalms for me would go from 66 through 70. I didn't get all the way to the end, but um, as I was uh, sitting with our, our staff uh, here in, the, in, our, in our staff meeting today, um, I had uh, opened up to Psalm 69, and I thought, oh my goodness, I needed to read that one today. Because it talks about all this stuff, and how we, we circumvent God's perfect laws, His directions for us, and we just end up in deep trouble with nobody to blame but who? Not the devil, not the devil, us. We don't need the devil's help to get into the trouble that we get in on our own, don't, do we? And we're all, we all are capable. So this section begins with some of the, the, the basics of the legal system, and, and you're going to see it as we just go through verse by verse here tonight. So the first one in, uh, in chapter 23, I told you, this is going to be like it was ripped from our headlines. It says, don't circulate fake news. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Don't pass on lies. Make sure it's true. Make sure you fact check it before you pass it on or post it. I have had to take some posts down because I didn't do that. I passed on rumors that were not truth. So it, it says to begin with, don't pass on lies. I, I love how this su- section begins with some of the basics of the, the legal system or jurisp- jurisprudence, as, as you would say. You know, the, the system by which we determine that we're going to govern our, our, our affairs as mankind. And remember that any legal system is only as good as those who enforce that system. It's not only as good as the people who are under the system, but those who enforce the system. And you know that there's troubles on both sides of, of that divide. 
What happens if you get a judge or, or, or a lawyer or a law enforcement officer that's become corrupt? W what do you do? You've got a mess on your hands. And I've, I've heard about that happening once or twice over the history of mankind, haven't you? You read about it in Scripture. Remember the story about the unjust judge. He just was a bad guy. He didn't care about people, didn't care about God. We went over that on Sundays a, a month and a half ago, I think. But here's what happens. They'll turn a blind eye. They'll refuse to hear a case that they should be hearing because it's taking place in their city, their county, or in their state, and they'll refuse to even give it the light of day. Or they'll take bribes, or they'll show favoritism, or they'll, they'll, they'll ignore the just penalty of the law. And they'll, they'll change it, and, and the system begins to fall apart. The people get cheated. Society will change to the new corrupt standard. And we've watched that happen down through history. And, and so as, as God begins to speak through Moses to the people, he starts with the basic, don't pass lies around. Just don't do it. Don't circulate fake news. Prove it before you pass it on. We don't need to explain all these all this much, but look at the next one, verse 2. No rioting, no looting, no mob justice. Did you know that was in the Bible? Did you know that would be in the Bible for tonight? I didn't plan this. What can you say? Here we go again in our nation. Is looting and rioting any way to solve a problem? Come on, answer out loud. Anybody? Is it any way to really solve a problem? It's a way to create more problems. So it says in verse 2, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Don't be, don't be an employee in the rent-a-crowd crowd. Don't be pulled into it. Just don't. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. No rioting, no looting, and no mob justice. The third one here in verse 3, no partiality. It says, now even to the poor. That's an odd, an odd statement. It's only half of what God has to say about, about the poor here, and he's going to get to the, the other side of this coin in a moment. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. There's supposed to be no partiality whatsoever. Verse 4, I love this part. This is, you know, just be a good neighbor. Look at verse 4 and 5. You know, if you don't bring a Bible with you when you come, borrow one of our Bibles so you can get your eyes on the Word of God, okay? Verse 4 and 5 says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under, his, under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Isn't that just, it just says, be nice to your neighbor. And even who? Even who? What was it? Even your enemy. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? He said, you've heard it said by those of old, you can love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus, when he says, no, I say to you, he could say, like Moses said to you, love even your enemy. And it's a practical way to show mercy to your enemy. You know it's his horse or you know it's his dog. You know it's his animal. And you think, oh, I've got him now. I've got him now. I'm gonna admit, maybe I'll get a reward See, if he waits long enough, he posts a reward. I'll get, I'll get some money out of this scoundrel. He said, just be nice. Be nice to your neighbors. Just be neighborly. Be a good. It's, it's part of the golden rule, isn't it? Do to what? Do what? Do unto others what you want them to do to you. Treat them in a kind way. Oh, that doesn't sound so spiritual, but it's deeply spiritual. And God says, just do the right thing. Just be a good neighbor. Now, verse 6, you shall not pervert the judgment of the, your poor in his dispute. Don't show them favoritism and don't show a bias toward them either just because they're poor. I, I love the fact that God said the poor get the same justice as everyone else. There's not to be any stratas in this society that God was going to build that he's governing. He, this is like his constitution, how we're supposed to live towards one another. No cheating the poor, verses 7 through 9. I love this part. It says, justice is not for sale. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a, a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. He said that earlier. 
And I think it's just such an important thing to remember where we came from. I wonder how many of us, I want to ask you to raise your hands. I'll give you, I'll give you the Wednesday off, Wednesday night off on raising your hands, all right? But I wonder how many of us in here have forgotten what it was like to be in darkness and people judging us when we were in darkness and how easy it is to look at people that walk the wrong way and say, oh, how could they do that? And you know it's the wrong way. And you have scripture to prove it's the wrong way. But how did you get reached? How did I get reached? For, I've told you this story before. 14 different times in the year before I surrendered to the gospel, 14 different people or groups of people witnessed to me. Instead of just sneering at me, turning their back and saying, that filthy hippie, he deserves whatever he's getting. They reached out to me and loved me. They shouldn't have. Many of them were really short-haired people. And they, they shouldn't have t spoken to me, but they didn't care. They weren't afraid of the way that I looked or the way that I talked or the way that I acted or what I smoked. They reached out in love to me. There was deep, sincere love for me. He said, remember, he said, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. He said, remember where you've come from. Oh, and this is just the basics of the laws, but just, you know, simple guidelines on how to treat one another and how to walk in a culture of people who are different than you, different than me. Now, down in verse 10, we jump into a, a different section here. This is a, um, a, about how many, about 10 verses on holy holidays. And the holiday wasn't just a party day for a picnic. It, it, was, it was a time to remember. God mandated a rhythm for his people of rest and celebration. Everybody say rest and celebration. And there was celebration. And, and the, the means of the celebration, the way of the celebration was also described for them. And we'll get into those later as we get deeper into in another passage about these, these festivals. And there's more than the three, but there's three that are mentioned right here. And we'll get to those in, in just a second. But to begin with, in verse 10 and 11, it says, let the land rest. Now look at the numbers in, in verse 10 and 11. Six years you shall sow your land, in other words, farm your land, and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. In other words, just let it go. Let it lie fallow, don't farm it, that the poor of your people may eat. So there would be volunteer crops that would come up because of some of the seeds of the corn or the weed or whatever they had planted. It fell to the ground. And he said, that's for the poor during that year. You let them harvest your fallow ground, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. So what else did the poor get? They got the fruit off the trees. They got the grapes off the grapevines. And they'd go around and it was theirs. They knew he's, you know, uh, um, uh, Abraham or whatever his name is, Gideon, whatever that, that Jewish man's name was, he's letting his olive grove go this year. That means, honey, when it's harvest time, we get to go over and gather some of that for ourselves and we can make some olive oil. And, and you can make that incredible salad that I love so much. And by the way, it, I, I, I heard one, one commentator say this. And I, th it's, I think it's a very, very insightful. If a farmer had, let's say, an orange grove and an olive grove and a, and a vineyard, it doesn't mean necessarily he would let all of them go dormant one year. He might rotate his crops, but on that, that time frame, when the seventh year came along, you'd leave it alone. You didn't have to, to do anything with it except let the poor eat from your, your uh what you had planted, your har your, your, the harvest of your grapes, the harvest of your fields, the harvest of your, your, uh, uh, your orchards as well. So let the land rest on a six and one rotation. You get that? You know what's coming next, don't you? The land gets to rest. In the next verses, you're going to see you get to rest. Let yourself rest. And, and, and here it is, verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 12 through 13. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day, stop working. Oh, this is still so hard, isn't it? On the seventh day, you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed, so everybody gets to rest, and the strangers among you, no work, 
No saws ripping back and forth. No hammers hammering. No shovel sounds. It was a beautiful, can you imagine? A beautiful, quiet day for everyone to rest. And I always like to tell people that the original intent of, of the Sabbath, everybody say Shabbat. Shabbat. You're speaking Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word for Sabbath. But Shabbat was just about resting. It wasn't initially a go-to-synagogue day. It was a stay-home day. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your tribe. You could walk a certain amount of, uh, of steps or a certain amount of uh, yards, I guess it would be. I think it amounts to about three-quarters of a mile you could walk. On a, on a Sabbath day. If you wanted to go see mom and she lived at the edge of town and so you would calculate that and sometimes they got, they got so legalistic on it it wasn't fun anymore. It just, it just wasn't. But it, you, let, you, you let your land rest and you let yourself rest and it was in the law. It wasn't just a, a suggestion from the doctor. We went to the doctor as I told you, the doctor today said, well, how, how about if you try this and how about if you do this? It wasn't the law from the doctor. It was a suggestion, but this was a law. God said, stop working. Everybody. Animals too. I love that part about letting the animals rest. And then in verses 14 to 19, it's like an extended rest. And this is the celebration part. Three festivals of remembrance and celebration. Let's look at these. Verse 14 to 19. Oh, I didn't keep reading, did I? Did I keep reading? I don't think I finished verse 13. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. He's going to say that a handful of times. God has to repeat himself because we are both forgetful and we're clever. We're clever at finding ways around what God said. So he says, no other gods, nor let the name of other gods even be heard from your mouth. And here we go, the festivals. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, which included Passover. Feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you and at the appointed time in the month Abib. Everybody say Abib. Abib. Now say it like a Hebrew, Aviv. Aviv. The B and the V, depending on a little indicator in the letter, is either a B or a V. So there's a city... In, in Israel, right on the Mediterranean coast, who knows the name of it? Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv. And it means old, new. And so the first name, I mean the first month of the year was just called new because it's a new year. Aviv just means new. We're starting over again. And so you shall, on the month of Abib, um, you shall Keep the feast of unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in that you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. There would be a sacrifice required. And the feast of the harvest, that would be the feast of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the days of unleavened bread. The first fruits of your labor, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. He said uh, when, when, it, when, when Pentecost comes around, which is the beginning of the harvest season. Now, harvest would happen with different, uh, uh, you know, different crops at different times, but typically at the end of the spring, uh, like around May into June, the harvest begins and it would keep going all the way through into the autumn. But it, when the harvest began, it was time to, to gather up a tenth of what you brought in and bring an offering to God of that and lay it down before him. Some things would be consumed, some things would go in to the storehouse for the priests that would serve the community. And, and so one way or the other, God just says, remember who gave you this blessing and come and bring it and it would be sp spread around or it would be a part of the sacrifice. And then in verse 17, it says, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. And it would be of a certain age, the adult males would appear before God uh, wherever the, the, the tabernacle was at that time and wherever the tabernacle would be when they came into the land or the temple where it would be built. If you could get there, you had to be there if you were an adult male. Now, you could bring your family. You could decide we're going to take this vacation together. And we're going to, how many of you love road trips? How many of you honestly did not like road trips as, as a kid? How many of you got, got car sick? 
Uh, let's not go there. But, but they, some of these would obviously be road trips when God dis- determined where the tabernacle would rest, and they were basically with the tabernacle as they moved through. But when they came into the land, and you'll see tonight as they spread out throughout the land, they would have to come together wherever the place of worship had been established, and it would definitely be a road trip. So three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God, and you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. In other words, everything to be burnt, everything that would be a burnt offering would have to be sacrificed and, and burnt right down to ashes on the day of the sacrifice. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. That is, that is still, obviously today, a law in Israel. And they're very, very intense about it. Um, to where they just won't even have dairy products on the table with, with the meat. They won't eat them together. And, you know, there's different opinions on what that's all about. God had some intent on that. I'm not sure that I totally understand it, but it sure seems weird to boil a, a kid or a baby animal in the milk of its mother. It just doesn't seem right, right? So for whatever reason, God gave them, um, among other laws, their kosher laws, and this is how they were to approach God. And as you came before him, you brought sacrifices exactly the way that he would tell you in these three festivals that were of remembrance, and especially that first one of Passover, where they would remember every year why the, the angel of death had passed over them and they survived that night of the death of the firstborn. Their firstborn survived because they put the blood on the doorposts. And you, you have to realize this. You have to see this. It's really so obvious. The blood on the doorpost of the home would represent the blood of Jesus on the cross for us. And when that blood is applied to us, when that blood was shed for us, it's one thing when we say, Lord, I believe that was for me, and we allow that to be applied to the door of our heart, then death passes over us. And we conquer the grave and we conquer the judgment of God and we conquer hell and we will never see a moment in hell because Jesus took the penalty for all and all who will receive that will never have to worry. I I have a a, a good friend, a new believer in Jesus and I I just love how eager my friend is to know, am I really saved? Am I really saved? I don't know if I've said this recently. I I was talking to somebody privately about it but... uh, (laughs) I think it was actually on the radio yesterday uh, with, with Brian Perez as we, we do the Tuesday afternoon broadcast uh, together live that um, I got saved in 1970, but for probably about a year and a half, every time there was an altar call, I went forward and got saved again, or I thought I did. You know why I thought I had to get saved again? Because I sinned, because I did something that wasn't right, or I said something that wasn't right. And I, thought, I, 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 guess, I guess I just got to go. I just want to make sure. But I was already saved. It was just God was walking me through the process of discipling me. And he was digging at those things that need to come out of me. There's still things. I told you I wasn't going to raise your hand. Just raise your elbow on this. No, you can raise your hand. Are there still things that God is after in your life? There's still things he's after in my life. And I hope, I hope he keeps getting after the things in my life that, that, need, that he needs to get after. And take me to a deeper place, a stronger place a fresh place in him. So all, all of this was just that, that reminder that, that they were now free and they had cause to celebrate. And as they would come into the land and they would plant their fields and the crops would grow, that they were, they were told by law, remember to bring some of that and bring it gladly. Bring it like you're putting it in the joy box. Yes, yes. And come with a, a cheerful heart. And, and give God praise that he's let your, your crops grow. You'll, you'll have enough. You will have enough if you, as you give. I was going to say, if you give. You'll have enough. God will be faithful. He will be faithful. If I'm generous, God's going to be even overly generous back to me too. And I believe that and I don't look at that as, as, as some corny law of personal prosperity to make me a billionaire. I've never lacked. God has been faithful. Oh, it's been thin at times. But I've never lacked. There's always been plenty to give, plenty to celebrate, plenty to spread around. Well, 
verses 20 down through 33. It's a different section here. It's good. It might even sound odd up here. This is fighting over our inheritance. It's not that we're really fighting for our inheritance. It's not that we're fighting for our freedom or for our new life. Jesus did the fighting for that, but there is still a battle. And let's look at this in verses 20 to 33. The first section of it is of 20 to 23. This mysterious guardian, look at this with me. It says, behold, now they're heading towards the promised land. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way, to keep you on track, and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Man, I love that. I, I want God to be the enemy to my enemies. And he'll take care of those that come against me and an adversary to your adversaries if you follow this angel. And again, he speaks of him in verse 23. For my angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Count them. Count them with me. Ready? Amorites, and read them with me. I dare you. Come on. You can do this. Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites. And um, what are those things, Dan, that you put in water? No, the stuff you put in water to... Re and, and the electrolytes. I think they were also going against the electrolytes. I'm not sure. But he said, and I will cut them off. So it's a mysterious guardian. I want to talk to, about the guardian before we talk about these, these nations. But I want to say something about that as well. The, mis the mystery of this guardian, this mysterious guardian, is his identity. Who is this? This angel. Um, the Hebrew word is malak. Everybody say that with me. Malak. And it, it's translated angel 111 times in the Old Testament. It's translated just simply messenger almost as many times, 98 times. That tells me that it could be an, a, a literal angel, an angelic being, but how would they know? I mean, was the angel literally going to appear and they'd see him, they'd have conversations with him, or was it a messenger? Was it someone like Moses? Or Aaron, is he just talking about a, a particular strong leader in the tribe that would keep them on track? And he says, he won't be kind to you like me. He, he's there to, to keep you on, on, on a trajectory, to get you to where you're going. And some say, and I think there's some, some possibility in this, that it might be what we call a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. We just don't know for sure. But whoever this mysterious guardian is, he is not to be played with. Whoever he is and whatever he is, he, he is not playing. He's there on a task to keep the people moving. And they're going to move. How long are they going to be in the wilderness? They don't know that to begin with. They think it's going to be a quick trip, and it could have been a quick trip if they had trusted him. But it's going to take a while. Have any of you noticed that it takes a while for God to do his work in us and to get us, quote unquote, into the promised land of perfection and holiness and righteousness and godliness and all that. It's going to take a while, but you know how often they will move? On the average of once every year for 40 years. And sometimes they'll move quickly from one, to another, one place to another. Sometimes they'll be there for a while. I counted the homes that I've lived in in my life, and I've moved on the average of once every two years. When Joy and I got married, it's become almost, right now, it's almost on the average of once every year we have moved, but we've lived in one house 13 years, one house 10 years, and another house 10 years. So we had a lot of years where we were moving really, really quickly from one place to another, maybe two times in less than a year. But these guys are moving, but they're going in a direction. God's taking them somewhere. So is it a literal angel? Is it Gabriel appearing or Michael or Clarence? You know, from the, the, you know, no. Is it an angel? Is it a human leader, a messenger who conveys God's directions and precepts and mandates? 
and is strong in his leadership, or is it Christ? I don't know. Maybe we'll watch the DVD together when we get there, or on Heavenly Netflix. So whoever and whatever it is, he's, he will be in charge, and, and they're going to need that angel. They're going to need the leadership of that angel. In verse 23, look at that again. It says, For my angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, enemies. And he said, And I will take care of them. I will take care of them. Six of the seven nations that they will need to deal with are listed right there. Let me show you the map. There's another nation. Can anybody... Does anybody know the name of the other nation that wasn't on that, that list of, of, of the six? The Girgashites are not in there, but they're about, you can, you're about to see them. So here's a, a basic map of, the, of the, the land as best as they can, can show you where these different nations, everybody, now read the whole list with me. Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And, and here's where they are. The Hittites are in the north and in the south, and the Girgashites just have one area around Galilee. It's one of the most beautiful parts of, of all of Israel right there. And the, the Amorites are on both sides of the Jordan River, and they would still cause lots of, of trouble to Israel. Uh, Canaanites um, along the Jordan River on the uh, east of, of Israel and then out on the, the Mediterranean Sea. And then the Perizzites, just one place in what's called the, the Plains of Sharon, up against the, the hills that would lead up to Jerusalem. And then the Hivites had, uh, I think, two play yeah, way up in the north, and then, uh, wait, was, yeah, the Hivites down in, in the middle there. And then the Jebusites. Who knows, who knows where the Jebusites were? What's the city? What was the city in the middle of the Jebusites region? Jerusalem. It was the, the, the town was originally called Jebus. The Jebusites were right there in what today is Jerusalem, the city that David took over. And so there's all of those nations that are around there. Now, how, how many of you can remember? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the slide. How many of you can remember all of the names? Can you do it? You know it would help? You know, why, don't we, why don't we make a song about it, okay? We'll do it in just a second. But I want you to see this. In Deuteronomy 7.1, no, watch this. It says, here, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Read this last sentence with me. Seven nations greater and mightier than you come the Israelites. Is, does that make you feel really good about going into the land? Seven nations that are bigger and badder than you are. There's more of them, and they're fierce. And they don't care who your God is. He says, why don't we just trot into the, into the promised land where it's full of seven nations that are bigger than you and badder than you. Now, that was in Deuteronomy. That's Moses speaking. Now we're in Joshua. Listen to Joshua. Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. I don't know why in some lists the Girgashites aren't listed, but in, in those two major ones they are. And so these people have to be thinking, could, could, could we go to Sweden instead? Instead of into a land where there's these fierce enemies everywhere that we look. But God was going to fight for them. You'll see that in the next section. So, the, the, and I just put that up again for you. Here's the song we're going to sing. No, we're not going to sing it because I can't remember the tune. I made up a tune to this and it would have been really fun, but you don't look like you're ready to sing tonight. So, just read it with me. Here come the Israelites heading for the promised land. Watch out, all you Hittites and Girgashites, Canaanites and Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites because you're going down and they are going down. One by one. Now, to me, it is so significant how this happens. It's a huge lesson here, though, and I want to touch on this before we go on. You need to know what they needed to know. And this gets real current, and it gets personal. Let me see the hands of those. I'm breaking my promise, aren't I? I want to see the hands of those that you know what your battles are in life. You know what your one, two, three, four, or five battles are in life, what you battle. Some of you battle dis dis discouragement like a plague. Some battle all kinds of, of different things. 
whether it's verbal stuff or moral stuff or honest issue, honesty issues. We all battle something. Here's a huge lesson. God is going to fight for you. He is your defender. And he promised that he would be our defender. We all face enemies who are bigger and badder than us, and we know that. And a lot of the stuff is just stuff that's within our own brokenness, and we can only defeat those enemies in Christ. But, so, but he says, be sober about this. In other words, wake up to this. And be vigilant, which means be on your guard. And, and, and we have to suit up for the battle. I want you to jot down these references. Um, I think I'm going to put them all, yeah, I'm going to put them up one by one for you. In Ephesians 6, 10, all the way through to the end of the, of the almost to the end of the chapter, write down the, the reference up there. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and please go home and read this in the next night or two where it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And he goes on to say, and put on the armor. And you can go through all kinds of gyrations to picture yourself putting on the helmet and putting on the breastplate and all that. But just listen to the operative words and their truth. Put on the helmet of salvation. You're not even beginning to win the battle until you're saved. Put on the helmet of salvation. And, and the breastplate of righteousness and, and the gospel of peace. Get your shoes on. So read through that passage. It's, it's, it's a part of the manual for this battle that we're all facing. 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. Re- tell yourself this over and over again. Today, Lord. Today, as I get up and I, I lace up my shoes and I go out for my walk or I, I go in the backyard and I sit down on a bench out there and I open my Bible. Lord, I know you're going to fight for me today. You're going to strengthen me. How many of you know that God wants you to win? God wants you to be victorious. You know that everybody know that? He wants you to be victorious. Tell him that, God, I know you want me to be walking in victory. I know your plan for me is, is, is honesty and purity and kindness and, and sobriety. Lord, I know you want all those things for me, and you will strengthen me, and you'll protect me, and I want to cooperate with you. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 to 5, the weapons of our warfare, powerful verse. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not swords and guns and tasers and and such. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God to pull down all of those strongholds. There's this one, James chapter 4, verse 7. Here's how you win. You submit to God. You resist the devil. And the scripture says he has to flee. He had dwell on these passages, and certainly this one in Romans chapter 6, verse 37 through 39. We are, it should say, it says 8. I said 6. 8, 37 to 39. We are more, read that with me. We are more than conquerors. You know the rest? Through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. What he won, we get to win. So you have to stand up and do battle. And I want to tell you something. Listen, it's going to be a battle. It will be a battle. From now until you see Jesus face to face until that final battle. The last enemy that's defeated is death, and that will be done like that. When you breathe your last breath here, you are home finally. And you're his forever. You never have to worry about that stuff again. Now one, uh, a couple more passages here. Look at verses 24 to 26. Just a couple of reminders. And I told you, God was going to repeat himself on this too. He says this. You shall not bow down to their gods. <laughs> there would be the temptation as they went in and, and they saw the, the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all the other ites. There would be the temptation just out of interest. So how do you guys worship? What kind of songs do you guys sing? And oh, what's the name of your big gods and your sub-gods? Just out of interest, just, just, just wondering. He said, don't even dabble in that stuff. He said, do not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works. Don't, don't go to their godless potlucks. And I'm not talking about a dinner with your neighbors. I'm talking about those, the, those uh, sacrificial meals that they would invite the people of Israel into when when the, the pagan worship began up in the north of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel, Dan, who were, they were portioned their lot down in the south, and they found themselves up in the most beautiful part of the country, and I think that's why. 
Honey, it's beautiful up there. Remember the last time we went on vacation? It was, why don't we, I just want to live in the north. And you'd get to the north and you'd make friends with people that worship pagan deities. And they were great neighbors, you know. And, and, and they'd bring your donkey back if your donkey wandered away. They were kind to you. And so you, you just went, well, let's just go to one of their dinners. And I wonder what that's like. And, and you began to condition yourself to do what they did and believe what they believed to the point, read it for yourself in the history of Israel, the people of Israel would sacrifice their children on the altars of the gods in, in the valley of the, of the Kidron, on the valley of uh, uh, the Hinnom Valley that would run into the, the Kidron Valley, the Kidron Stream. And I, I remember reading that and thinking, how could they do that? How could they? It didn't happen overnight. They just slowly leaned that way. Joy read the book years ago. It was a big, fat book. I think I'd never read it. It was called The Source by James Michener. It tells us the story uh, at one point of a man by the name of Orbael, a worshiper of Baal. And to make this story very, very, very brief, he wanted the blessing of the gods upon his, his fields and upon his life. And the pagan priest came along at a certain time of the year and he would mark the forearm of certain children. And that meant they were being marked for sacrifice. And the priest came by and marked his child. And his wife began to weep and he forbid her to cry. Because the gods would be insulted if she, if she wept and didn't give a free will offering. And one man in the tribe was gifted on the day of the big celebration as their children were offered. One man was gifted with the, the, the grand prize to go into the, the temple with one of the priestesses for I think it was for a week of just a sex party with her. And he was chosen from the crowd and he leapt onto the stage and he took her into his arms and disappeared behind the curtains. And his wife, weeping in the crowd, says to her friend, if her Baal had been a different God, if, it, if her Baal had had a different God, he would have been a different man. The gods you worship determine who you will be. They really do. And so it was a sobering, sobering thing as they began to, to sacrifice. But God tells them so explicitly, don't do what they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God and, you, and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you and no one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land and I will fulfill the number of your days. The reminders and the, and the promises of God, remember who you are. You're the redeemed brought you out of this land of bondage. Remember who God is. He's your deliverer and serve God and forget the other gods and all the other idols. God will bless you. Here's the promises. God will bless you. He'll feed you. He'll keep you healthy and he'll keep you fruitful. I think the, the fruitfulness was both for the, the couples and for their flocks and their herds. You'll multiply and you'll be blessed. Now, in verses 27 to 23, and we're moving through this very quickly, we get ready to close here tonight. He says this, I will send my fear before you and I will cause confusion among all the people. Here's how they're going to take the land. Everybody read the phrase I put up there. A slow and steady victory. Slow and steady. Listen to what God says. I will put my fear before you. That is in the face of the people the lands are going into. Can you imagine looking at that map I showed you? And, and wondering, you, you, you see, if you knew, well, the, the Girgashites are there in the middle and the Hittites there in the north and the south and the Hivites there here and there and the Canaanites, where are we going to live? There's no place to live. These people won't want us there. Here's what God says. I'll, I'll send my fear before you. I'll cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and I will send hornets before you which shall drive, uh, will God please keep them before us. If you're sending the hornets, keep them before us, not in our face and not behind us. 
not coming after us, but I'll send the hornets which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you, and I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too num numerous for you. Read verse 30 with me. But little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land, a slow, steady victory, a certain victory, and God would do it. Remember this. This is where it gets personal for us, I think. God will fight for his people. He said, I'll confuse them. I don't know how we would do the confusion, but I'll tell you what's happening in the world today. But you agree there's a lot of confusion in our land. I'm wondering if God is stirring something with all this confusion that man can't figure out. doesn't matter who's in the White House. They haven't been able to figure it out, how to stop it let alone what's, what's, what's going on at borders and all that. There's just confusion every, everywhere. And so he would bring confusion and then the hornets, a plague of hornets over three nations. Look at this. At the, the, there's the map again. And here's the three that would get hit by the hornets in the north, in the center, and in the south. He said, I'll make a path for you, and I'll get you. And you know where, which way they'd be coming in? Look at this right here. He said, I'll drive them out with hornets, and this is where they'd be coming through. At the top of the, dead, of the Dead Sea, they would come up across right where Jericho is, and God was making a way for them to get into the land. And they weren't all gone, but some of them were gone, and, the, and there would be room as they would move in, and God would do what he said he would do. It would be a slow victory and a growing strength. And so let's talk about our slow growth. I'm so impatient, aren't you? Are you impatient with me? I'm far more impatient with me than you'll ever be. But, but I, I'm impatient. I, I, I want to grow now. I want to be perfected now. I want that stuff now. And we want to run before we learn to walk. We have to learn to walk or crawl. And, and, and you know, if, if you know God is calling you to do something, and he is. How many of you are saved? Let me see the hands of the saved in here. God has a calling on your life and something for you to do for him. But be patient as you grow and as you dig into his word, as you study his word and, and prepare yourself as you, in patience as you grow and listen and watch and serve and you discover your gifts and when you know what it is and you're ready to run. But in those early years, as God's, those formative years, let him form what he wants to form in you and be diligent. As much as it depends on you, be diligent. Now, the last thing I want you to see, verse 31. The boundaries, oh, this isn't the last. We've got to finish the chapter. And he says this, still in the same section. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. He said, I'll do the hard work, and you will drive them out. Look at this. The, the boundaries that would be set for Israel we're a little bit bigger than that, but that's the land that they have. Now, there's another place, and we won't get into it till I think we get into De Deuteronomy. The, the boundaries that God would eventually give to his people included the river Euphrates, which is way up there. Let me go back right there. And, and there's something about a boundary that comes down into the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and I think the, the right side of that bottom red line should swing a little bit further to the south. God had given them so much, and the one, the, the one qualifier was this. He said, wherever the soles of your feet touch, that will be your land, including the, the following the border of the Euphrates River. Well, they've never had that. Israel has never... Um, uh, taken that part of the land that God had given them. Why? I, I'm, this is just a suspicion. They stopped walking. They stopped walking with him. It was God's intent. It's in his word. He had promised them much greater area. In fact, it's interesting to me that it said out to the Euphrates, that's the area that Abraham came out of. Like God was giving him his ancestral homelands from his ancestors. But they stopped walking, and you know they stopped walking with them. They had stumbled, and they had fallen in those desert years, and he had to take them out of the land. And where did he take them captive? North of the Euphrates. He took them off of that map and up into that region that was supposed to have been theirs. And I think to me there's just a, a, a really sobering reminder there 
that I need to keep walking. If I'm going to take the land that God wants to take in my life, and it's, it's a metaphor, but if I want all of that kingdom life and power and truth and, and, and you know, just vitality, I need to be a man of God. You need to be men and women of God that just keep walking and you will get stronger and you will go further and you'll take the land of holiness and you'll take the land of power. And, 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 and vibrancy, and you'll take the land of peace, and you'll take that land of hope, and you'll move into that land of love and kindness if you keep walking. There's no other way around it. You have to keep walking. Wherever the soles of your feet touch, they'll be yours. It seems like God had much greater things planned for them than they ever, as far as we know, ever really took. Look at verse 32 and 3. You shall make no covenant. He says it again. Enough of the idolatry. You shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Oh, my goodness. That's the foundation of all of our testimonies, isn't it? We got ensnared in the things of the world. And we've got the sad testimonies, the sad stories to, to prove it. Boundaries of the kingdom. I know one day, you can close your Bible up, and if the worship team would come back and get ready to close us tonight. The boundaries of the kingdom where God wants to take us. One day, my brothers, my sisters, and Jesus, we're going to inherit the land. I want you to spend some time the next day or two thinking about what that will be. We will inherit the kingdom. The new land will be ours and we will know what everybody wonders right now. The mysteries of what the new Jerusalem is all about. You're going to go into it and out of it. You're going to know what the new heaven and the new earth is. You'll see new mountain ranges. And, and Dan and April will be hiking all of the trails into those mountain ranges. Those guys are such hikers. And I'm going to be taking hiking tours into those too, I hope. And we'll, just, we'll get to in, inherit the kingdom and enjoy the kingdom. And every bit of it, every bit of it, and never have to wonder about any trail being closed. Do I need my mask? No, you won't need your mask. Do I need to stay six feet apart? No, you don't need to stay six feet apart. We'll be greeting one another with a holy kiss again and, and walking in that, that deep, deep love of the kingdom. And so I, I, I just encourage you, listen... Keep your, keep your eyes focused on this stuff and keep your mind as much as you can wrapped around these promises that God has for you and I. And keep fighting the battle. Don't give up in this battle. Keep fighting that holy fight for the inheritance that's yours. It's yours. Lift up your hand if you're one of those people. You know, you know you're a follower of Jesus. I'm not asking for any perfect hands because there aren't any perfect hands. Lift your hand up if you're one of those followers of Jesus. Lift the other one up and let's pray. Father God, we want, we want all that you have for us. We sing songs that say that, God. We really do, and we reach out for your mercy tonight. We thank you for your truth tonight, Father. Even the lessons that we learned about us by reading about Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel. Oh God, would you take us deeper? Would you please, Lord God, take us to fresh places, new places, stronger places, Lord. personal prayer to God tonight would you tell him in, in your own words oh God I need your help in your own words tell him what you need his help on right now as we're singing if you know that what you need to do right this moment is just lift that whispered prayer to God about where you need his help say that to him right now don't wait till you get home to forget so as we sing you pray Father, I pray tonight that change would be broken. God, I pray that addictions would be broken tonight, Father. God, I pray that right now, this evening, as hearts are crying out to you, Lord, desperate for you, Father, not casually, but desperate for you, Lord, that you would lift the darkness, you would lift depression, you would lift hopelessness, you would shatter hopelessness tonight, Father God, and you would bring freedom like never before, Father, that they would step over the threshold tonight, tonight, and give it to you, Lord God. 
God, I pray that you would just, you would stand against the enemy. You would, you would send out the hornets, Lord God, and just drive that enemy, break the hold of that enemy over hearts in this place tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, we need the freedom, Lord, that there is in the Son of God, and the Son sets us free. We are free indeed, Lord. We thank you for the freedom. We celebrate that freedom tonight, Father God. We thank you, God. We shout against the darkness, God. We shout against the enemy, Lord. And we receive your freedom. We receive salvation, Lord. We receive cleanness, Lord God. The cleansing of your spirit, Lord. prayer tonight, I want to ask you to, to come forward right now if you need prayer. Not, I'm not saying does anybody want to chat about football, but if anybody wants prayer tonight for something that you know needs to, needs to be broken or set free in your heart, I invite you to come forward right now as, uh, as the crowd is dispersing and you would uh, linger for a bit. You've got time for this. If tonight is the night and you're ready for that freedom, you're ready for the fresh, you're ready for the new, you're ready for This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.